guys uh, it's been a while uh, I've been <laughs> things have been crazy um, a lot of deaths happening all around me um, which isn't very good it seems like uh, death is becoming the theme of this year which I'm not uh, obviously it's not a pleasant period of time um, as of last November I had uh, a member of our church pass away um, then six months later, going into 2015, um, his wife passed away from cancer, which they didn't know she had. She found out, um, went in for tests and found out she had cancer. And six months from that time that her husband died, she also passed away. Then uh, first week of March, we lost another parishioner who died of a heart attack, another incredible and amazing uh, man, uh, awesome um, serviceman. He served his country in uh, Desert Storm, served his country uh, in Vietnam. Awesome, awesome man. Uh, brilliant man. Um, had a really high level of clearance. Um, and he, uh, yeah, it's uh, that was a huge blow. I mean, he a very decorated uh, sergeant actually and, and and it was I don't know it was, that was sun, sudden that just happened uh, he died in the library had a heart attack uh, then that Thursday of that same week in March uh, my wife's father died uh, now my uh, the music minister who's an extremely close uh, friend of mine at church I mean I've been I've known her since I've been in the church I've been, I've attended the church I'm in now for 15 years and uh her mom any day now is supposed to die my father has his cancer's definitely turned around uh it seems to be he, he looks horrible I don't I'm he doesn't give me the straight answer on anything so I can't really but I know I, I can't see him living another you know past a year if that so it's just it's been crazy um but that's not why I'm uh, going on here. This isn't really an update video, and it's not one to sit there and uh, play the um, the violin uh, because of all these uh, happenings that are a part of life, right? Um, well, one, I, I have been around. I have, like, checked videos out. I actually have filmed a few things uh, on the side that I will actually put up. I, I don't, I'm not going to say when, though, because uh, obviously I... I just too, I'm just too busy to say I'm going to do something. And I hate saying I'm going to do something and I don't do it. That try, And I do that often because I get so busy and I don't, I'm like always wanting to do everything uh, that I see in front of me. It's just not a good, something I have to learn is pacing. But I was uh, going through Hibernia Sun's uh, video, The Politics of Hate, The Rats Are Freaking Out. And I thought that was a very thought-provoking video. Um... I, I'm going to add some two cents in there since uh, that's pretty much what I do. Um, and I'm involved heavily in ministry and plan on, of course, my getting. I'm getting emails while I'm recording. I should have closed that. Um, and he's talking about, like, from a Christian perspective, what, what are you to do? Are you to arm yourself? Do you arm yourself? A lot of people are talking because of this church thing. Um, should parishioners be armed um, now going to church? Uh, and that's, you know, that's an interesting um, uh, issue to bring up. So before I go into that, though, um, I want to share a book that I, I read a lot. And one of the things I tend to always have in my rotation, I generally read a book every day, a different one. 
but I theme my days out by topics. Like I read history on Mondays, I'll read something entertainment-wise on Tuesdays, I'll read something ministry-minded or scriptural-minded on um, Wednesdays, then I read something on uh, information on the conferences I do every year, something on the Middle East or Islam or um, Jerusalem or whatever. So that that's kind of what I do. Well, my, the one book I'm reading, and I think it's something that I wanted to share with people who are in preparedness, or and it's a it's and it's for the people who like to look up history, learn from history. Um, is this one? It's uh, Marcus Aurelius, A Life, um, by um, Frank McLinn. Uh, this is just phenomenal. Um, it, it not only is it phenomenal from a standpoint of you know my studies on scriptures and of that matter, but it's phenomenal as far as a history lesson. How um, every nothing new is under the sun. Everything is always repeated, and this is a reason why our forefathers studied heavily Rome. He, uh, were heavily educated in um, the philosophers of uh, that Rome studied as well, like Plato and 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 um, Socrates and all. They, they were very uh, learned on the on those topics as well as the study of Rome itself. Um, but this book, and I'm just going to go into. Uh, I'm just going to read really quick something that was very interesting on how they were dealing with uh, the the barbarians at the time which were causing problems and they were trying to do their best to try to you know keep them uh at bay and so what they did is that when they weren't at war with them and i'm going to read this all this began to change as roman impact on germania became more pronounced after 50 bc the influx of wealth from trade and Rome and from money subsidies paid by the Romans to keep the tribes quiet made certain individuals wealthy and gradually displaced communal communalism with private property. Trade burgeoned as Roman merchants penetrated into Germany and even took up permanent abode among the tribes. The demand for Roman goods grew, imports increased, the wealth owned by individuals burgeoned and... Um, the economy became monetized by trade, by wages paid to those Germans who served with the legions and by the subsidies paid to the chiefs. Trade in cattle and slaves with Romans was important, but the dynamic new element was commerce in amber, since the only source of high-grade amber was the southern shores of the Baltic. It was in high demand at Rome. Areas engaged in this long-distance trade, trade, such as Pannonia, especially benefited. Salt, fur, and hides were also exported from Germany, while imports included Roman ceramics, especially the finest red tableware, uh, or terra sigillata, uh, and the best Roman vintages, which were greedily devoured by wine-crazed Germans. As the demand for Roman goods increased, there, throughout the first century AD, more and more Roman traders and moneylenders were found on German territory. Meanwhile, German society itself became markedly more stratified, with something of a crevasse opening between the wealthy nobles and the masses. By the end of the century, the old clan system had virtually disappeared, displaced by quasi-feudal grouping of rich aristocrats with their personal retainers. The new class-bound society was the entering wedge the Romans used to control Germany. Their policy was to tie the new aristocrats to them with money and trading favors while dealing harshly with the have-nots. They liked to take hostages from the sons of the tribal leaders and then educate them in Rome, teaching them to despise their roots, then sending them back to subvert any anti-Roman trends among the tribesmen. Um, and it goes on to say, um, the, the kings, the pseudo kings that they established in, in uh, the, the barbarian territories or the German territories, uh, these kings were given money to buy off the opposition and to spend on conspicuous consumption, consumption that denoted their new royal status. They thus became creatures of Rome. 
in some cases more sympathetic to the interests of the Roman state than to those of their own people. For them, the advantage was not just undreamed of wealth, but the instrumentality to impose their will on the tribesmen as they had never been able to before. To cow the opposition expected from the masses, the Romans would threaten at the limit to invade and lay waste the tribal lands, though they rarely had to intervene. Their client kings usually performed effectively. effectively. Even if a pro-Roman ruler actually was expelled by the masses because of unpopular pro-Roman policies, um, the Romans still had a card to play. They would keep the expelled puppet as a king over the water, ready to lead dissident factions against the new rulers, if they did not come in terms with Rome. The final weapon the Romans had was to refuse to ratify any new ruler they did not approve of, which meant the end of trading privileges and money subsidies and the threat of invasion. The Romans' perfect divide and rule in Germany, both by setting the difficult tribes at each other's throats and by generating strife and class conflict within the tribes, setting feudal retinues and private property against the masses, who were dedicated to clans and communalism. The trick was to keep powerful tribes in a state of permanent chaos and near civil war, while at the same time ensuing that the Roman protégés never became powerful enough to bite the hand that fed them. Sounds pretty uh, familiar. That was a little long. I probably could have abridged that, but I'm kind of going off the fly here, as per usual. Um, so I found that very interesting. Um, we're so busy fighting each other and we even have I mean it seems like the Democrats and Republicans are working in the same direction they're doing the same things and then you have this uh, trade world trade agreement that the Republicans are pushing including Paul Ryan who was someone I, I really liked but what we need is somebody, and I never thought I would actually say uh, say this, but I mean, someone like Rand Paul, who's basically going to undo the power structure, and that's what's happening. Uh, it seems to me the leaders have no problem um, relinquishing some sovereignty through a trade deal, uh, because it ensures power to them. I'm sure they've got backdoor deals, and this this hinders on the on on our sovereignty and this is another reason why the the battle of taking away the weapons is always always um being brought up and uh, and they jump on the opportunity such as this church massacre i mean no sooner did it happen obama is already saying this is the reason guns are the reason and uh <laughs> it's ridiculous i mean it's it because it, once they the biggest th hindrance to a world government, let's say, is the United States. Hands down. The civilians are armed, um, even though if it came down to when, if the federal government truly wanted to completely change uh, or change their, their direction, uh, we, we, <laughs> we wouldn't really be able to do a lot about it. Uh, hopefully there's, there'd be loyalists in, in, in our military, but who knows? I mean, some of the technology that you see um, being used overseas in the Middle East um, can very well be used here as it was um, talked about using drones here on our own soil. Okay, so what, what is, where am I going? What, what am I getting to here? And how does this tie in with uh, some of the things Hibernia Sun was talking about? Now, in essence, he, he, he's right. I mean, you go into uh, different parts of the Bible as a Christian um, and you talk about the, the point where the, the, his followers had swords. Well, only two of them had swords. Um, I'm not sure of one of them, but I know Simon Peter definitely had one. Simon Peter was a, um, zealot. If you want to learn more about the zealots, just Google zealots. They were just kind of a radical religious Jewish sect that believed in the overthrow of the, uh, government to establish, um, the theocracy of old, um, and they believed in using violence to go about doing this, which is interesting because it's kind of similar to the liberation theology that the Pope has embraced or says that he's embracing, 
um, where it talks about um, undoing the, the current structure and restructuring um, to, you know, spread the wealth, so to speak, almost like a, a theology of um, communism, socialism. And they, they believe in using political and co uh, community organizations to go about this. Well, what's a community organization? That could still be a government organization. Um, so if that catches on, um, they can undo the very structure that we have here, which is the capitalist society, that the, um, which is slowly um, being cut off at its knees, or actually getting cut, death by a thousand cuts. So, um, basically, so why do the, why, 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 in comparison to guns, how, why were the disciples having weapons? And when you go into, uh, Matthew 26, um, which is, um, verses 50 and 52, um, John 18, verses 10 through 11, one of the things you notice is <clears throat> when he pulls out the sword, he cuts, uh, the um, Pharisee's slave, as sometimes it's mentioned, or soldier, or the guy who's the, the, one of the people who are coming to seize Jesus, cuts his ear off, and Jesus told, tells him to put away the sword, um, put it back in a sheath, and those who live by the sword die by the sword. So it's kind of interesting, because it says those who live by it die by it. But one thing you have to take note is he didn't tell him to throw away the sword. And in fact, if you go into uh, Luke um, 22, I think, verse uh, 36 through 38, you have an example of them selling or being told to sell clothes to acquire um, swords. Um, and why why would that be? I mean, what, what, I mean, it's 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 a religion of peace, right? Well, he he doesn't ever like take away the fact that the sword is still on one's person why did he tell him to stop in his attack of keeping jesus from get, being seized it is simple it's if you're doing it out of vengeance obviously there's a problem but if you're doing it out of you're protecting yourself that there's no feeling of um hatred or there's no feeling of revenge um and that's basically what Simon Peter was doing. He was acting in a revengeful manner. And so he told him to put away the sword. So those who live by the sword, in other words, use it to enforce in a manner of oppression or use it in a way that's um, not in self-defense or not in, in a manner that, I mean, some civilians are put in a position where that's their job, military. Your job is to, to protect the home front. Or go and do, or get involved in war um, to prevent anything coming on to the mainland. Or that you have civil servants like uh, the police officers and whatnot. They have um, a certain um, level of authority that's been given to them, and that is part of that authority of protection. And there are some people that really <laughs> shouldn't even have weapons. Obviously, this kid shouldn't have had a weapon. So it's a whole sense of responsibility. It's not meant to be gotten away with. You, you, I mean, we still live in a broken system that, unfortunately, there's evil out there and there needs to be um, a means to protect ourselves from that evil. Now, there are also religious people that, ha I mean, mostly you have to lead your life. If you're, you're in ministry, you have to lead your life in prayer. And if you're not feel feeling led to um, have a gun, or if you weren't even feeling led to, to prep, then if you don't feel it, if you're not sensing it, and you're in commune with God, then that's that's between you and Him. That's uh, I've prepped to a to a certain degree, but I don't get obsessed with it, and I don't you know make it my life's uh, you know goal to have everything I've ever wanted in prepping. Um, if I feel led to have certain weapons, I will acquire those weapons. I mean, and if I don't, I, don't, I won't. Um, so it's, it's really a personal thing. But those in the civil uh, service or in the military, 
then obviously you're someone that <laughs> are going to need a gun or in in the biblical times a sword um so i mean simon peter was a zealot so he would probably have a sicka because they were known to carry and hide those um swords in their cloaks um and there were other points where in Luke 9, you hear you know, the disciples actually ask Jesus if they can call fire from heaven on the Samaritans that weren't welcoming them into their city. Uh, he sent them ahead of, ahead of himself to uh, prepare the way, so to speak, and they weren't welcoming him. So they went back to Jesus and said, should we uh, call fire upon them? <laughs> and he told, he rebuked them. So if you're, you're doing it or you're, if you're setting yourself up for protection, if you are, you have a family, you have, and you're the head of, of the household, I would recommend having ways to protect yourself, a gun um, or something. But uh, yeah, it really is necessary to have a weapon. It really is. Um, but if you really don't feel led to do it, then there must be a reason. And that is that is that is your choice, and that's what you've dealt with God. I felt led to to acquire certain things, and that's how I live my life, you know. And I, you know, those who um, stay close to God, those who pray, they will hear His voice. Like that, you will hear, you will be led, you will know. So that's how I live my life. Um, so I hope that kind of adds a little bit to what Hibernia Sun has talked about. I am, hope you um, get Marcus Aurelius A Life by uh, Frank McGlynn. Um, it's a fascinating read if you really want to see similarities. Uh, just the whole Roman structure, which I've already known, but it's amazing how the structure is so similar to, to this day and age where, where people were obsessed with um, keeping up with the Joneses, you know, and the aristocratic... Um, um, circles. It's just, it's, I, I really recommend it. And I think one of the most important things you can do um, for preparedness, for making educated choices when it comes to voting, um, I would hands down say that uh, reading and researching, uh, there, there is no more powerful prepping tool than the mind. And you have to feed it, you have to, you, uh, and you have to try to make time if you can. If you're not a reader, then then look for ways to educate yourself through videos, but do really good research on the videos. Make sure you, you vet out any biases that, you know, might end up leading you down a certain path and giving you, like, uh, half-truths. Because a lot of times in videos, you got to be careful of that. Sometimes they, they do it deliberately. Other times they do it just because they're sit trying to get out as much information in a short time frame of a video or a movie. Um, so they might gloss over things too quick. Uh, reading and researching really helps you retain a lot, so. But anyway, that's it. That's 22 minutes, and there is, like, nobody that's going to sit through 22 minutes. But I just wanted to go out here. It's not really a updating video. It's actually kind of a semi-quasi, uh, <laughs> prepping video slash, um, um, religious, um, take on what's going on with this uh, the the talk of this church shooting and uh, and the politics of hate the rats are freaking out. I'll put the uh, the link of the video I'm I'm commenting on below. I try to catch your videos, Hibernia, whenever I can, and I've been in the background watching. I haven't been commenting as much, but um, I try to catch as many as I I can. Um, I see you have an end times prophecy one, so I think I'm gonna be. Wow, look at you. You're going all religious on it. The Word made flesh. See, I missed all these, so... And they're they're just as long... Actually, I mine are a lot... This is a lot longer. Let me get out of here. <laughs> 23 minutes, 29 seconds. No one's watching this. Do your best, like I did the rest, guys, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to post stuff in the future. Bye.